we praise him for he is here he's here to minister to speak but he's also here to receive our worship hallelujah oh god we just bless you we bless you we say you are worthy hallelujah lamb upon the throne forever we give you all the glory god hallelujah the glory is yours the honor is yours oh god hallelujah amen amen before you're seated just connect with some people and just speak a word of blessing in their lives even if you say god bless you it's it's a powerful word but just just bless someone in the name of jesus Come on, find about three, four, five persons and, and just bless them. It's a quick release of a word in their lives. Good. The Lord is good. Amen. A very pleasant and blessed morning to each and every one of you. God bless you abundantly and it's good to be here today amen it's good to have you here to see you here and in in this strong atmosphere of the presence of god it's so rich and real i want to um to go into the word i want to minister the word and pick up from where we left off as we speak blessings upon you we give God thanks for each and every one of you and for what the Lord is doing in your life. It's a great work he's doing in us, huh? And as we continue to pursue him and press into him, he's going to pour more upon us. I hope you can handle what he's about to bring upon your life. Amen? Amen. The next thing God is going to do in you is going to be great. Can you tell someone that? Somebody heard bad news this week. You need to give them good news. The next thing God is going to do in the earth is going to be a great thing in your life. Amen. Can tell someone else that? I'm serious. Come on. Connect with somebody. Tell them. And then to those behind you and in front, you tell them. Next thing God is going to do is going to be great. Next great thing God is going to do is going to be in your life. Amen. Can you walk across the church and tell somebody that? The next great thing God is going to do is going to be in your life. Amen. Release the word of the Lord upon someone. Can you walk to the back and tell somebody that? It's going to be great and it's going to be in your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Can you say amen to it? Amen. Are you looking forward to it? Because it could happen today. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can just very well wake up tomorrow and bum into that thing. Hallelujah. And you know what God says? It's going to be sudden. You need to ask somebody and tell them, get ready for the suddenly of the Lord in your life. Come on. Somebody got to walk to the back and tell somebody who want this word, get ready. For the suddenly of God in your life. Amen. Amen. Oh, yes. Suddenly.
You see, hallelujah. I just received that in the pit of my spirit. You see, the, the disciples of Jesus were in the upper room and they were waiting for the thing God had promised them. And the Bible says, suddenly, there was a mighty sound of a rushing wind. Some of you have been waiting on that thing that God had promised you. And I declare, the only suddenly will not be on the day of Pentecost because today or tomorrow will be your day of Pentecost. Suddenly there will be a sound that comes from heaven upon your life and just alter everything concerning you. Amen, amen, amen. You see, if you're a disciple like them, you get in the suddenlies also. I'm ready for mine. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Can you ask somebody if they're ready for theirs? You ready for yours? You ready for yours, Susan? Hallelujah. Can you look at somebody and tell them it could be now? Hallelujah. Could be now. Man, if you grab hold of this word, you're going to see it happen in your life. Those who believe, receive. So therefore I say to the believers, receive, 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 receive. In the name of Jesus, it's going to happen. I'm sorry if you doubt, because you're going to do without. But I believe, so I'm going to receive. You're going to receive it. Hallelujah. You're going to receive it. You're going to receive it in the name of Jesus. And we call it done. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. Woo. And we can dismiss the service. But I prepare this, so I'm going to preach it. Sorry for you. Ah. <laughs> ah, you want to go home early? Not today. Not today. <laughs> Suddenly church over, you know. <laughs> we have a special visitor we want to make. Special mention of before we go into the Word of God. Born in Barbados, but all the way from Toronto. Elder Harris, son is in church today. Where are you, Kevin? Oh, there you are over there. Come say hi to Kevin. Elder Harriet got up before you, boy. He just came in for the week. He just came in with, um, for the week, and Elder Harriet was so happy all week long, man, walking with an extra pep in her step. I don't know what's going to happen Tuesday <laughs> when, when he's gone, but good to see you, Kevin. God bless you. As you're here for the week, last week, and you go back to Toronto tomorrow. All right, let's get back into the word, Colossians chapter 3. And let's see if God will permit us to finish this today. I'm not rushing the Lord. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. We're continuing talking about living according to heaven. Just let you know that on Tuesday, Prophet Duane and Tao and Pastor myself will be traveling to Trinidad uh, to speak in a conference there with um, Prophet Brent Pedro. Most of us will know him. Uh, we'll be heading down south in Marabella. So I want you to remember us in prayer as we travel on Tuesday um, to speak at the conference there in Marabella in Trinidad. And we'll be back, God willing, next week, Monday. Thank you for your prayers. Now, last week, 
we, we started to talk about uh, living according to heaven. How, how do we do it? The things that God wants to do in our lives. And I started out by saying that we have to pursue heaven. The Bible says, if we, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. And we're covering around uh, from verse 1 to around verse 16 or so. The first thing I mentioned last week, if you, if you weren't here, if you forgot, please purchase the CD. The first thing we need to do is pursue the things of heaven. The Bible says, seek those things which are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of the Father. So we need to seek the things that are in heaven. We need to pursue those things. And to seek them in order to find them out and to embrace them. We're to strive after the things of heaven. We need to not just study them carefully, but also take them upon ourselves. And secondly, the Bible says, set your mind on things above, not things on the earth. So we are told to set our minds on heaven. To think on things in heaven. To ponder on heaven, the things of heaven. Uh, to allow to think so much about heaven that it changes our attitude, our conduct. Uh, we ponder on it so much that it affects our mind until the mind of Christ is formed in us. And I can't go over all of these things. Philippians 4, it tells us whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And uh, we ended off last week uh, by dealing the third one, we, we are called to die. Paul said, we have died and we have to ensure that the old nature is out of the way because the old nature rises up against God it cannot accept the things of God it can't understand the things of God it's opposed to the things of God so if you want to live from heaven you got to understand it needs to be a dying a dying to self a dying to sin dying to the world dying to the things of the world and be focused on the things of heaven. Romans 8, 5 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And we know the things of the Spirit are the things of heaven. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And then it goes on to say, because indeed, let me go, because the, I've lost my, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It opposes God. It comes up against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are of the flesh cannot please God. So, the old nature, the carnal mind, cannot please God. It is opposed to the things of God. It cannot understand the things of God. That's why the Bible calls it the carnal mind. Uh, it, it is not subject to God. And it cannot be. And then Paul ends off, and those who are of the flesh cannot please God. So if we are to please God, then we must please him through living out in a new nature that he has given to us. That's the only way it will be effective. That's the only way we can please God every day through our new nature, not the old nature that must be out of the way entirely. So I want to move on. That was my introduction. Now, point number four. As we step further, Apostle Paul says from verse five to seven, therefore put to death 
your members, not the church members. It's talking about something else. Put to death your members which are on the earth. And he explains, the earthly things. So he was just talking about uh, setting your mind on things above, not things on the earth. Then he's saying that we have to put to death certain earthly things. And he calls out these sins that we need to put to death. Now, this is not the complete list. He's just started off the list. There are other things we will have to put to death. But fornication, uncleanness, passions, or, or, or in the Greek, sensual passions, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. He says, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. It may be asked, if Christians died, if we died with Christ, why, why is this old man still trying to be active, or the old nature? When a man becomes a Christian, our focus and the focus of the Holy Spirit in us is to put to death the deeds of the old nature. It is something that we have to do. We have to carry out the execution of the things of the old nature. And as I said, Paul listed some of them. We have to acknowledge that the old nature is crucified with Christ. Therefore, the deeds of the old nature cannot be effective in us. We have to put them to death. And Paul used some strong terms. The, 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 the same term, put to death, he's saying, crucify the, old, um, the sins in our life. And he mentions some of them. Paul is picturing our bodies as containing two lives. One that needs to be truly dead. One, the natural life, or the flesh, and the other, the spiritual life. The life of the spirit, which has been given to us by God. It came from heaven. Now, If this life comes from heaven, then this life that God has given us can accept the things of heaven, not the old nature. We cannot serve God through the, through the flesh, as we call it. We must serve him through the spirit. So by the spirit of God, we are to put to death the stuff of the works or the deeds of the old nature. And we're to put them to death for good. If we are to live according to heaven, we must put to death the, the works of the sinful nature. Because we understand that we have died and our life is now hidden with Christ in God. And because of this, we can put to death the, 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 the works of the old nature. And then we can truly identify with Christ. Or as we identify with him. Let me go on to explain. The phrase to crucify suggests that we are to, we're not simply to suppress or control our sinful uh, works. We're to wipe them out completely. We're to get rid of the old way of living. That's why Paul said, put them to death. So they no longer exist in our lives. It does not mean, let me suppress these things. It means get rid of them entirely. We're not to gratify any sensual appetite. If we do that, we're giving the old nature the very food and nourishment by which it will, it will thrive in our lives. 
It is also interesting, before we, we touch briefly on some of these things, it is also interesting that Apostle Paul says to us, to church at Colossae, and to us, put to death the works of the flesh. If you understand what Paul is saying, it is not to us to pray to God to get rid of the works of the flesh. We got to do it ourselves. You see, it is our responsibility. That's all in the process of working out our salvation. The, the very fact that you are saved and God has placed his nature in you, it means that you have the ability, you have the power to deal a decisive blow to the works of the flesh. Whatever they are, put them to death. Because these sins invite the wrath of God. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 22. Sorry, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22. That you put off concerning your former conduct. You see, it says former. Therefore, if you are saved, let me pause there. If you are saved, the life you used to live is former. It can't be present. Ouch. Now, am I saying we don't mess up? Of course, we, we, we would mess up. But I'm saying the former life must not be the present life. The word of God tells us clearly that if we are saved, the life that we used to live is former. Therefore, if it is former, we can put it off. It says, put off concerning your former life or conduct or behavior, the old man which grows corrupt according to its deceitful lust. In Romans chapter 6, verse 5 and 7, 5 to 7, it says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of Christ's death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that the old man was crucified with Christ, so that the body of sin might be done away with. That's powerful words. That we shall no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Paul is here. Listen to Paul. I want you to listen to the language of Paul. And I will let the Holy Spirit Work on, work on it with you because we're still in the process of understanding a lot. He says, for if we have been united together in the likeness of Jesus' death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Here's the part we want to go on. Knowing this, that our old man, our old nature, was crucified with Christ. Then if my old nature was crucified with Christ, it's dead. And get that. So if my old nature is crucified, I should not be talking about old nature. Mm. Paul, you got something here that we still got to get. He says, it was crucified with Christ that the body of sin might be done away with. So because our old nature was crucified on the cross, sin hear me now, can be done away with in this life. Ouch! Paul, what are you trying to tell me? Paul is trying to say with us that if Christ did a de uh, dealt a decisive blow to uh, our, our old nature, he did it so that we can live this life in the new nature and that sin might not be a part of us. Now, I didn't write that. That was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I, I can, we can see that according to the word of God, sin can be done away with in this earth through the child of God. Now, a lot of us may not get that yet because we are not at that point where we can understand that we, 
We are born again not to sin. So the Holy Spirit God allow that to, to dwell in you. But the, but the other point is that if the old nature is dead, why are we getting on the way we're getting on? You know what we do? It seems as though we go and we perform a resurrection every day. It seems as though we go back to what was crucified on the cross and raised up again because we think that we have to live a particular way if we're to make a point. And the enemy is fooling us that we have to live like this. That's why, that's why Paul said in Colossians, put to death the deeds of the old nature, not the old nature. Because he's dead. I hope you're getting what I'm saying. It's the deeds. It's the habit. So my old nature is powerless. It's just that I live by habit according to stuff. Now I have to crucify that, the habits, the works of that which is dead. Are you getting what I'm saying? I hope you're grabbing this. They say if a man has a limb amputated, suppose he has a, a leg amputated, that instinctively he tries to walk. Because the memory has not come and get into the realization that a limb is missing and he could fall a lot. It takes him time to get accustomed to that which he usually that which he had before. And it's gone, but he still tries to walk. You get what I'm saying? Instinctively. And our old nature is dead. And the word of God is saying it's dead that the body of sin might be done away with. If our old nature is dead, what God is calling upon us to do is to crucify the stuff that we are accustomed to doing by memory. Those things should not have a hold on our lives. We are able now, because the man is dead, we are able to kill the children, the works, the deeds, the product of him. Then Paul says that we should no longer be slaves of sin. That's the former life. For he who has died has been freed from sin. I declare to you today that you are free from sin. And if you are free from sin, you don't have to sin. Amen. So if I'm free from sin, why do I sin? And it's simply this, I choose to go back into that which I should have killed a long time. And I, I do it from memory. Let me tell you something. There's no demon, whether in hell or wherever they are, Satan himself cannot make any one of you sin. Not if you're saved because you're not a slave to it. If you're a slave to sin, you sin. That's, that's what you do. But if you're free from sin, if you are no longer a slave to sin, you don't have to sin. Don't tell me you can't help yourself. If you can not help yourself, then something else is happening. That can only be dealt with through prayer and deliverance. So I don't have to lose my mind if I don't have to. I don't have to get, I don't have to say harsh things to people if I don't want to. I don't have to hurt people in my words. I don't have to give them peace of my mind if I don't want to. I choose to. You got what I'm saying? And we, we look at people who are nice and say, you made me say that. No, you chose to say that. It 
If I don't want to talk, you can't make me talk because I don't speak of myself and from that old nature, I speak from the Spirit of God. You can't make me tell you off if I don't want to. You get what I'm saying? We choose to. And I, I want you to get that. I want you to take it home with you because tomorrow when things come up against you, you can choose to say the right thing or the wrong thing. You can choose to react or respond. You can respond by the Spirit of God or by what you know as habit. Based on what is dead, it's simply habit. You get what I'm saying? So Paul says, Paul did not say put to death the old nature. Paul said he already did. But what Paul says, put to death the deeds of the old nature. The works, the product of the old nature. And he lists them, fornication. The word is translated sexual immorality and refers to any, any sexual intercourse outside of marriage. It refers to adultery, uh, pornography, homosexuality, lesbianism. This, this term, uh, the Greek term, uh, refers to that. He talks about uncleanness. And all these are sensual stuff. It's a wider range of meaning than fornication. It includes the misuse of sex, but it's also applicable to various forms of moral evil. Passions. Lustful and sensual passions. Put that to death. You, not God, you. It also means uncontrolled passions. Evil desires, a deep longing, a craving that's rooted in evil. Or evil concupiscence. As I like the Old Testament, uh, the King James Version term. Evil desires, evil immoral desires. We can put them to death. In fact, in one, in one scripture... Paul said, I think it was Paul, he said, they should not be even named among you. Because you're free from sin. Then he mentions something, covetousness, and he throws it in there purposely because he knew what he was talking about. And he calls covetousness greed. He calls it idolatry. Covetousness, greed is idolatry. And why is this? Because This is mainly because a person who is greedy or covetous focuses all his attention and energy on that which he covets, that which he craves for. It becomes his main goal and ambition. It becomes first and foremost in his mind, in his heart. And he spends all or most of his time going after that thing. And because it takes first place in his life, it becomes a God. And it's idolatry. But I believe that the Holy Spirit can also show us a certain things that we need to put to death. And again I say, Let's not bother praying and ask God to kill it. Get rid of it. So, Apostle, you mean I can stop doing that? Yeah, you can. The power is inside of you. You're saved. You're free from sin. It's just like a man who, who's in, who was in jail, and he's, he, he's finally, after all these years, set free from jail. He, he, he's accustomed to that culture. In, in jail, this, and they tell us the people who've been in prison for a long period, when they get out into freedom, uh, there's this thing that, that's pulling them back there. They're free, but there's a pull because they're accustomed to that life. It's a culture now. And a lot of them have to go through a, a lot of uh, rehabilitation and all of that in order to get accustomed to what they call outside. And like us, we were accustomed to dealing with a particular situation this way. We're accustomed to giving our bodies. We're accustomed to all these things. But now we are in Christ. Now we're saved. That thing can be killed by you. So Paul says, put them to death. Crucify the deeds of the old nature. And then in verse 8 and 9, 
he, he, he says something else. But now you yourselves are to put off all of these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth, lies. I say do not lie one to another since you have put, put off the old man with his deeds. It is interesting that Apostle Paul, in verse, oh dear, verse 5 to 7, sorry, says crucify or put to death certain sins. And now in verse 8 and 9, he says put them off. So you're trying to tell me that there is big sin and little sin? I thought all sin was sin. I thought we were to crucify everything. I don't want to get into the big sin, little sin, but simply to say, even from reading in the Old Testament, there were certain judgments that God placed on certain sins. And others, others, he could, abomination, death must be put to death. Others, he said, go and offer sacrifice. And you, you can work it out from there. However, in verse 5 to 7, Paul was dealing on sins of the old nature, behavior, deeds of the old nature. And now from verse 8 to 9, he's dealing with attitudes that come out of the old nature. All need to be dealt with. It sounds to me as though Paul is saying, deal a decisive blow to fornication and covetousness and, and, and all of these things. But when it comes to these other things, he's saying, just put them away. It seems to me that certain things, with certain things, easier to put away than others. So he said, these things, don't let them come back in your life. These ones, put off. Put them off. It's like taking a garment off and throwing it away. Having nothing else to do with it. These are sins that come out of attitudes. They're related to wrong attitudes. Attitudes of the old nature. Anger. A feeling of annoyance. Of fury. While wrath is more a passionate and intense anger. Put it off. Malice, the root of, of which is wickedness. In the Greek, the root of malice is wickedness. Um, where, you, where you devise uh, wicked deeds to a people, I can deal with she, you don't know she's dealing with. And you come up with a plan to hurt someone else. That put off. Take off. Then there's blasphemy. Uh, the King James Version, the New King James Version says blasphemy. Uh, the, I think the NIV will say more slander. But the term blasphemy comes from its root. Uh, blasphemy, there's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and blasphemy against others. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is, is speaking, is, is attributing is evil to the Holy Spirit. And speaking blasphemous against the children of God is, is slander. The church does not slander. Amen. Y'all went quiet like if you, you disagree with me, you had me scared here. Blasphemy or slander, evil and malicious speaking, Put it off. You can put gossip in there. Take it off. Words that intend to harm others. Take it off. Filthy language. Abusive or obscene talk. Take it off. Lies. This also is not just the white lie, but the black one, if there's a difference. 
lies, it, it, it involves verbal abuse. It includes suggestive words and comments. These are to be gotten rid of. Then there's lying. I think I mentioned that. Yeah, lying. Uh, to communicate what is false. Uh, to communicate, communicate that which is dishonest. That which is deceitful. That which is misleading. This too. We've got to put away. Get it far from us. All Paul is saying is if we're to walk according to heaven, if we're to truly live according to heaven, we must get busy killing and putting away. Because it's the process that we have to go through so that we can live pure before the Lord. Because if we're to serve God, we must serve him through the new nature, through the spirit. I, it is our responsibility, it is my responsibility to deal with stuff in my life as the Holy Spirit shows me and as I know so that the new man can live strong. In order for the new nature to live strong, I have to kill and I have to put away. Give a life sentence, and I have to also carry out punishment of death. You get what I'm saying? It's something that we have to do. We, we have to come to a place in our walk with the Lord where we cannot just accommodate. Oh, this is just me. No, no, no. It was you, but it's not you. And sometimes we get real happy saying, this is me. You got to take me as I am. No. Even God don't want to take you like that. Because when God saved you, saved you to clean you up and make you a better person. Stop saying, this is who I am. Start saying, this is who I was. And put it away for good. There's some of us who are called by the name of the Lord, even in our jobs, our attitudes. Oh my goodness. We have, we, we have some dirty attitudes, even with our workmates, even to our bosses. Get rid of it. You, are, are you hearing me? Living according to heaven means that I'm dealing every day with stuff. What I get rid of, I don't go back for. I can't borrow something that I put in jail. I got rid of it for good and then gone back for it when, when I want to deal with my wife. It's done. I have to deal with one another, whether you're your spouse or whether you're a child of God or whether the person is unsaved. I have to deal with them through the nature that God has put in me. Because you're unsaved, it does not give me the right to, to deal with you as you will deal with me. And we say, ouch then. Because you, you see, when I am saved, it simply means I begin to deal with my brothers and sisters in the church differently. I should never allow my mouth to declare tough words from the old nature. But look at you walking in church. And they think you're better than anybody else. That's your opinion of them rooted in the old nature. Get rid of it. Does she gone up front all the time? Does she just come in church and I know she won't push herself up and get rid of it. Get rid. That's old nature. It's what you're accustomed to, but what you're not now. Get accustomed to the new. Oh, it's a glorious life. Get accustomed. Oh, I bless her. She's recently come to the Lord. And man, I declare she will walk with God. We don't do that often. Right, she always coming up prophesying. 
I said, now whenever she prophesied, I can sit down. I'm receiving what she said. Like a cord. Get rid of it. Come, come, Prophet Glenn. I want you to do something for me. You mean every Sunday, it'll come up and prophesy? All the talk you do. And then you can't understand. The Lord said, the Lord said. She ain't hearing nothing from God. What you want to do? Get rid. Of it. You look at your spouse and you say, I'm sorry, I'm on you. You're the worst thing that happened to me. Should not be coming out of your mouth. What you have to do? You, you threw that too easy. I don't want the style about here. You're going to get rid of it. You get rid of it, you discover something just. Something flew out. It's a button or something? Oh, car keys. I thought this flew out. I was. This not old nature, though. I bless you with it. You want to throw again? <laughs> then no more money for you. <laughs> Thank you. called upon to put to death the works of the old nature and to get rid of them. Don't give occasion for it to rule in your life. Amen? Don't give occasion. You see, very often we, when we have decisions to make, when we are confronted with situations, what we usually do is, is borrow from the Old nature or the worst of the old nature in order to make a decision. And it's just like going to the grave and trying to find out the thoughts of a man that's dead in order to make a decision. It's dead. We borrow from the deeds of the old nature things that we should put to death in order to make a decision. When we get upset, we draw from the from the old. When we have to deal with situations, we draw from the old. And we do not understand there's a new and powerful nature living inside of us that's yet to be discovered. And we always look back to the old to borrow. This is how I need to deal with this situation. But there's a new nature, which we're going to touch on in a moment. If people slander us, we tend to allow the old nature to deal with them. No, let him die. If someone hurts us, we usually allow the old nature to deal with them. But you know the new nature deals, can deal with them? And more powerfully? The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 14 to 21. It's a little lengthy, but I want to read it. This is how we should live with one another. I want to read it. And I want you to do it. Bless those who persecute you. Hold on. Bless those who curse you. Bless and do not curse. You, you, you can handle more? Rejoice with those who rejoice. Don't get envious. And get jealous. Because somebody got through. Somebody got their breakthrough and got you and you vex with them. Cut it out. Get rid of it. Rejoice with them. We usually rejoice with we usually rejoice with them who weep though. But no, we should weep with those who weep. You get what I'm saying? Be of the same mind one toward another. How I treat me, I need to treat you. How I expect you to treat me, I need to treat you. 
Do not set your mind on high things. Continue where we are. But associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Because just your opinion. Repay for no one, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And if possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceable with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath. And I, I know eye for eye. I ain't getting back at you. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Continue. Therefore, here's the sweet part. If your enemy is hungry, do what? <laughs> some of you got to start feeding some people, boy. I hope not in church. That we shall have no enemies in here. If he's thirsty, give him poison. Sorry, give him something to drink. Oh, give him a drink. And I know some of you smart, deep people will say, but the Bible did not say what to put in the drink. Tell me a bit too deep for me. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. And somebody quoted this, you know. I'll give them something to drink. And I know it will heap coals of fire on their heads. <laughs> do, not, oh, do not be overcome by evil. But overcome evil with? Why? Because good is stronger than evil. That's why I said to you, if you deal with people through the new nature, the new nature is stronger than the old one. So that is just a glimpse into how we should live. But number six, and my final point, the Apostle Paul said, he gives us things that we have to embrace now. These are the things from heaven. But it's a process. Pursuing God. Pursuing heaven. Thinking on the things of heaven. Dying to self. And as we do that, not after, but as, we deal with the works of the old nature. Crucifying and putting away. And now we're embracing the things of heaven. In verse 10 to 15, Paul says... You have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbar barbarian, Scythian, slave, or nor free, but Christ is all and in everyone. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender, this is stuff we got to put on, because if you take off and throw away, you got to put on and keep. Therefore, we got to put on, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness. These are stronger things than what I mentioned before. Humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another. That's important. And forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, as Christ forgave you, you do what? So you also must do. And above all these things, put on love, which holds them together, which is the bond of perfection. In fact, you can't do all, any of these unless you truly love. That's why Paul said, above all these, put on love which is the bond of perfection, or which holds these together perfectly. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you've been called in one body, and be thankful. Now Paul describes the behavior, the conduct, the characteristics of the new nature. It's important to note that the new nature is from heaven. 
The Bible says that the new nature is created in the image of Jesus. Look what he said. It is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created it. That new nature is created in knowledge. We're going to touch on that. It is created in knowledge to know God then. It is designed to access heaven. It is designed to embrace the things of heaven. And the things listed in this passage are all things of heaven, not of earth. You see, because the new man is renewed in knowledge, he is hungry to know God. Not the old nature. Your nature is hungry to know the stuff of the earth. But the new nature is hungry to know God. He's hungry to go according to God's word. There is a desire within our new nature to please God always. It always wants to know what God has to say. It always needs to know more about the word. You've got to feed it with this stuff. Because he is created in knowledge, as the Bible says, according to the image that he's created in. We know Adam and Eve was, Adam and Eve were created in the image of God and then they sinned. And when they sinned, that image was tarnished. But because God always has a plan, God's plan was perfected in Jesus Christ, who came in the likeness of, of God, who lived a sinless life on this earth. And now we are in him. The image of God is being formed and fashioned in us. And it can be only formed in that new nature. The Bible says in the first epistle of John that the seed of God is in us. Because the seed of my, 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 my parents or my father is in me, there is some resemblance. Whether to how I walk, how I talk, how I look. And because the seed of God is in us, in the new nature, we can look like God. We can look like Jesus. God is fashioning something powerful inside of you. And whenever a prophetic word comes forth, it is meant for the new nature. You see, God wants us to a place where our new nature rules us. You get, wait, 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 let me say it differently. Where the new nature is prominent in us, not the old nature. Not the deeds of the old nature. God wants the spirit of God to rule in us through his new nature. So that decisions are to be made. My mind, my old nature doesn't do it, but it's God. You got what I'm saying? That, that is done through the new nature. My new nature must rule my soul and my body. If not, we are in trouble. So now we are in Christ. There is a new nature that's inside of us. And the image of Christ is being formed in us. I want you to know this. That this thing that's being formed in us by the Holy Spirit. Is more glorious than what Adam had. Adam was powerful. But this new thing that's being formed so that we can look like Christ. Because if Christ is superior to Adam, if I'm in him and I'm being fashioned to look like him, what is inside of me is superior to that which was in Adam. It's more glorious, it's more powerful. But the thing is, it's, it's hidden, it's masked because we tend to live out of that which is old and not what, that, what is new. You don't really understand what God has done in us. If we really 
awaken and we really step into this new thing that God's done in us, we would be some of the most powerful people in the earth. As I said last week, we're living below what God has intended for us because we choose to live from the old nature and it's all worse instead of the new nature. There is something happening inside of you by the Holy Spirit, which is more powerful. Adam longed to have what we have. That is why the Bible says that we sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Wow. Now listen. You will, you must become Christ-like. The more we know Christ, the more we pursue heaven, the more we embrace the things of heaven is the more we will look like him. And somehow I am not there yet. I am still working on this thing. How am I to look like Christ then? Am I, am I expected? Are you expected to look like Christ yet? And looking like Christ means as we walk this earth, we want this earth living above sin. Don't tell me it can't happen. My word says so. And I choose to believe what the word of God says. So I am, we are in this process by the spirit. But as we submit to him, the more of Christ will be seen in us. But we must let go of the old. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, I don't know if, I, I didn't give this to the guys, so just listen. My dear children, Apostle Paul says, Galatians 4, 19. My dear children, for whom I am again in the, in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Paul was actually saying, I am praying, I am interceding for you that Christ be fully formed in you. When Christ is fully formed in us, that's when we grow up into that perfect man. Don't tell me we got to wait till we get to heaven to live above sin. Oh, no, no, no. Don't tell me we have to wait till we get to heaven to see that perfect man that we should be in Christ. No, no, no. If the Spirit of God can have his way, we can do it here on earth. I don't want to get to heaven into something that's new. And saying, wait, what this is all about. I want to live it here. That when I'm translated, it's just me moving into a different space, but behaving the same way. You get what I'm saying? It can be achieved here. But this Christian life is not one that's just meant to come to church on a Sunday. Only. Or pop in on a Wednesday when something to you special is happening. This Christian life must be lived every day in the spirit, walking in the spirit, pursuing the spirit, talking to God, drawing from God, doing everything possible. It calls for work. And I am seeing Christ formed in some of you. I am seeing how some of you came in here and how you are now. And I know he's being formed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 47 to 49, Paul was talking about uh, answering some questions about the resurrection. He's talking about the day we'll be resurrected. And then he slipped, as he usually does, into something different. And he said, the first man was from the dust of the earth. And the second man is from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. As is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. We are like Christ. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, we shall, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. Paul did not just mean when we get over yonder. But Paul means now on this earth we can bear the image of Jesus Christ. That he is formed in us. You see, when that happens, and when we take on the things of heaven, tender mercies, our compassion, kindness, caring for each other, 
being benevolent, when we take on humility, those are things of heaven, not being arrogant, when we take on meekness or gentleness, and long-suffering or patience, when we have perseverance and endurance, and nothing can cause us or nothing can make us give up and give in, when we bear with one another, when we put up with each other, this is a quality from heaven. Because not everybody can be put up with if we do it out of the old nature. Because there's some people who are in a process that we have gone through. And we have to put up with them. We have to bear with one another. It is in the church, it's in the marriage, it's in the family, it's at work. But when we take this upon us, we'll be looking like Christ. Forgiving one another as Christ forgave us. There's not one person who's born of God that say to me they can't forgive. Then I say Christ is not being formed. Don't tell me you don't know what they did to me. Forgive us, Christ has forgiven you because he didn't look at all the stuff he, you did to him. He forgave you in spite. And let me tell you, there is nothing... Let me put it in this language, forgive me. There's nothing nobody can do to you that's worse than what we did to Christ. And if Christ can forgive us, you can forgive. You get what I'm saying? And he says, above all these things, but on love which holds them together, and then the peace of God which keeps us in, in, in harmony and in tranquility, in the midst of turmoil. And then he said, be thankful. You see, when we put these things and we embrace them, we draw on the things of heaven and we embrace them, then we live differently. A man or woman who lives like this can never be miserable. A man or woman who lives like this can never be grumpy. A man or woman who lives like this will never treat his family will never entreat his wife, will never entreat, a woman will never entreat her husband, um, mistreat her husband. You're more entreat, not mistreat. A man or woman who, who, who lives like this will be the sweetest person in the earth. And a man or woman who lives like this, doors will be opened up for them. Heaven will be opened up for them. A man or woman who lives like this, you lay hands upon the sick and they will recover. Because hell, even hell, responds to you because you're living like Christ. But you see, before I, before I quit, I just want to peer into verse 16. I just want to peep into just peer. Because verse 16 is the back end of this, and I'm done. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. See, if we're to live like this, God be happy. You have to feed the new nature. And the only way you can feed the new nature is with the things of heaven. It can't handle any other diet. you got to feed the new nature. And as you feed it with the things of heaven, it becomes stronger and prominent in you. But Paul, Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly or abundantly. I understand then that if I allow the word to dwell richly or in great abundance in me, that word is active in my spirit. You see, Jesus walked this, Jesus walked this earth. You know why he was successful? You know why? Not just because he was sinless. You know why he was successful? Because he was filled with the Godhead. The fullness of the Godhead 
dwelt in him bodily. And that's why when he did something, it was easy. Because he appropriate what, appropriated what was in him to its fullness. So it was easy then to say, be healed. And it was healed. And it was, it was easy then to say, demon, come out. And there was no argument. And it was easy to say, what's wrong? Come forth. Because the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. But hear what the word says. This is for you. This is for your new nature. Let the word of that Christ who was filled or who is filled with all the fullness of the Godhead dwell in abundance in us. When his word is, when we are full of his word, we cannot help but spit in word. We cannot help but release in word. It's no longer opinion, but it's what the word says. It's no longer what we feel, it's but what the word says. Because it dwells in abundance in us. And in our new nature can accommodate the fullness of that word as it dwells in us. When we want to make a decision, it's based on the word, not on our own intellect. Because our new nature understands that our intellect don't know a thing. But let me tell you, when the word is of abundant in you. You begin to speak the word and you see things happen. When the word is abundant in you, you lay hands upon the sick and you speak according to the abundance of that word that's in you and you say be healed and the sick must be healed because it's not just responding to you. It's responding to the abundance of the word that's in you. Are you getting me? This Christian life is not just a send or go to service thing. That's why some of us not seeing the stuff. But if the word is dwelling in me, I am like Christ. Because the fullness of all that God was or is, was in him. And when I have the word in abundance, the fullness of all that the word is, is active in me. Because the word of God is alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen. It is able to pierce even the bones and the sinews and the tissue. It goes to the very core of man's being and alters stuff in his life. I can no longer. Oh, well, no wonder Jesus said, I can't speak what I feel like. Because what he felt was not in him. I might not have said that right. He couldn't speak what he felt like. Because all that was in him that was flowing in him was the fullness of the Godhead. Ah, when you're full of the abundance of the word, you can't speak what you like. The word comes forth. It oozes out of you. You declare what God has already said, not what you want. And when a man or woman gets like that, he's dangerous. Shifts things. Things respond to him. Things come in alignment because he's not saying his own thing. Oh, I want people in the earth to be like Jesus. I don't say what I feel like. I speak what's inside of me. That's the abundant word. I don't do my own thing. I do what the word tells me. I don't go my own way. I walk where the word shows me. Because every day, as the Bible says, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Oh, it's going to get there if it's not in you in abundance. So therefore, your life must never be taken up with just reading Psalm 23. Or just a verse. It needs to be rolling and abundant in you. It needs to be growing in abundance in you. It needs to be flowing in abundance with you. And all deep inside of you. And when you begin to speak, you speak word. It's no longer Stephen or Sandra or Carlene or Ingrid or Sonia or Val. It's word. And you know when we speak word, what happens? The Spirit of God cannot help but respond to it. 
because he's the one that breathed it. So therefore, if I'm to live according to the new nature and live as truly a child of God, then I must be different. It can't be commonplace any longer. It can't be life as per usual. It can't be living there and out doing the same thing. There's a dynamism going on inside of us. Oh my goodness. We can never be bored any longer. And let me tell you, when the word is dwelling in abundance in you, because the word is alive, the word talks to you. <laughs> oh my goodness, the word speaks. And it speaks strongly. Therefore, when you speak out of the abundance of the word, out of the abundance of the logos, you speak rhema. And when you speak rhema, you speak life. You speak fresh things in the earth. That's why when Jesus opened his mouth, even if he spoke from the Old Testament, he was speaking rhema because it was in him and he was it. I want no longer to be Stephen Holtbury. Having an opinion. Having a feeling. Well, I feel it happen. But when the word is in you, you flow in abundance of wisdom. That's why the Bible says, let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. In all wisdom. Admonishing, speaking to one another. In Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. It doesn't mean that if I have to speak to you, I speak to You know that I miss you. But when you speak from the word, it's a psalm. It can be a hymn. You get what I'm saying? So when... Then you stand with the mic and you begin to sing. Spiritual songs come forth. I encourage you, not based on my feeling, but from the word. When I talk to you, even if I'm not happy, I don't respond from that which is dead. I respond from the word. I don't do what I don't do to you what you do to me. I shouldn't do to you. It must come from the word. And I must speak to you out of that abundance in Psalms. A hint. It's spiritual sound. So that you can make melody in your heart. You got what I'm saying? Because that word affects me in every area. In my friends, in my workmates, in my school friends, in my family. So when I declare to my children, it's not out of an abundance of anger, but it's abundance of word. I'm done. Hallelujah. The question is asked, come worship team, the question is asked, can we get there? Oh yeah, we can. God doesn't say something that can't happen. But you know what? It's up to us. Because when you get home and tomorrow, you can go back to what you know. You can, pour me some water. you can go back to your old way. You can go back and respond to what you're accustomed to. Or you can make a decision from today. I'm living a different life because the seed of God is in me. May the Lord bless you as you stand together. I don't know what you're going to sing, but sing. Even if psalm, sims, and spiritual sounds come out, but 
Let's just worship. One thing we need to do when we receive the word is just be thankful and receive it with thanksgiving. Just, just, just create that incubation within you for the word so it can continue to flow in you. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your word, God. Let's just thank him. Thank him for the word. Just ask him, just, just thank him and just allow that word to go deep inside of you. Find root inside of you. Come on, can we just lift our voices and thank him? Hallelujah. We bless you for the word today. Receive your word. Oh God, let your word come alive in us. Let find root in us. That we may live according to the word. Not according to how we feel. Not according to what someone said. Not according to intellect but according to that word. Father, I ask today that we, that we will put to death every work of darkness. And we will put off every attitude and everything that flows from our attitude. We will die to self and die to sin and die to this world so that we can come alive to you, O oh God. And we will begin to draw from heaven the necessary things that will sustain us and strengthen us in the earth. My Father, I bless you. Hallelujah. Let's just continue praying as pastor just continue to pray. Father, we just give ourselves to you, God. Father, Lord, you, even as the word come forth, Holy Spirit, even now, come, Father, and just rearrange, God. Father, even as we would have heard, Lord, that there are things that we're supposed to kill. Help us, Holy Spirit, even now. Give us, Lord God, the insight and the revelation and the wisdom, Father, of how to kill God. Father, and kill them decisively, God. Father, you said that you've already crucified when we, Lord God, came to you, God. Lord, that there was a work of death that happened, not just in Jesus Christ, Father, but in the old nature. Father, it was crucified, Lord. And now, God, you're telling us, Father, to crucify, Lord God, the things, Father. Crucify them, God. Put them off. Put them to death. Father, bring an understanding of what you're saying to us, God. So that, Lord God, that we will be obedient to the word, that we would hear the word. Father, Lord God, and also the attitudes, the deeds that... The, the, the things, Lord God, that comes with attitude. Father, Lord God, that we're supposed to put them away, God. And Lord, then we're supposed to clothe ourselves, Lord God, in the things of Christ, God. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come and do a, a work in here today, God, with our, all of our lives, God. As we hear the word, as we receive the word, let the word, Lord God, go deep down into our innermost being. Let it find root in our lives today, God, so that the word can become alive in us, God. Father, Lord, you're telling us, Father, that the word should become a part, Lord God, of our daily diet. Because it's by the word it teaches us how to live, how to kill, how to crucify, how to put off. So Father, I pray God that we will not just be Lord God, a, a weekly digestive system where we just eat the word weekly Lord God when we come on Sunday. But there will be a daily thing Lord God where we dwell in the word, where we live in the word, where we Lord God communicate God. Lord, with heaven, so that heaven can impact our lives. Father, increase our desire 
Lord God, for the word, increase our desire. Lord God, for the things of the word, increase our desire. Lord God, that we would live in obedience, Lord God, to the word. Because we can read the word, Lord God, but then the word, Lord God, is not lift out. So help us, God. Lord, as we read the word, as we digest the word, as we meditate on the word, day and night, Lord God, that the word will become alive in us Lord God so father we heard the word this morning we read the word this morning Lord let that word Lord God that was be released over our lives let it God go deep down deep into our innermost being God and God let the word be activated Lord God in our lives so that fruit can come forth so that lifestyle change can come forth. Father, so we are better in the workplace. We are better in our communities. We are better in our homes. We are better wherever we go, God. This transforming word is evidence, evident, God, in our lives, Father. That we transform our world. That we are transformers of our world God Lord God that the word is so rich in us that our very present Lord God sometimes we don't even have to say a word but our very present bring attention bring transformation to other people's lives God Father we want to be like you God we want to be like you in the earth God we want to be like you in the earth, Lord God. And we hear this morning how we can be like you, Lord God. How the miracles can flow. How the demonstration of the power of God can flow, Lord God, if we crucify and put off and then clothe ourselves. Help us, God. We cannot do it by ourselves. We need help from you this morning. Holy Spirit, we need help from you, God. We need help, Lord God, to understand what the Holy Spirit is saying to us, to us today. So God, I pray that we would be silent and that the Holy Spirit will speak. We will be silent so the Holy Spirit will be able to speak. Father, for too long, our flesh has been talking, God. But Lord, we want to hear you. So we do only what you have told us and will tell us to do. Do it in us, God, as we give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen.